Hello everybody and welcome back to another A-Level Chemistry exam question walkthrough video. In this video I'll be focusing on entropy which is from the thermodynamics topic. If you'd like to have a go at these questions yourself before watching my video, those are available for download in the description. And then when you watch my video, you will see that I'm reasoning out loud and I'm writing down my thoughts behind the question in blue. And then the answers that are going to get you the actual marks, those are going to be written in green. So you really can tell what you need to put to get 100% in this question. This first part of the question is a really common Gibbs free energy question. We're being given six marks and we're told to calculate the delta G value, the Gibbs free energy in kilojoules per mole. That will be really significant in a bit. And there are always three parts to these questions. Sometimes they actually break it up and have a part one, part two, part three. Here they haven't. They've just given us a big block of space to write our working out. Now, I'm just going to start near to the end here and delta G is delta H minus T delta S. And so what that means is prior to calculating delta G, we have to calculate delta H and we have to calculate delta S and we have to acknowledge that the temperature T is 890 Kelvin. So if we're calculating delta H using these enthalpy of formation values, we need to remember that the delta H, the enthalpy change, is equal to the enthalpy of formation of the products minus the enthalpy of formation of the reactants. In each case, that's the sum of all of the enthalpy changes of the products or reactants. And so what we need to do first is we need to say, right, well, here are our products and here are the enthalpy changes of formation for those products. We multiply it by any coefficients that there were, but they're both ones here. And then we need to subtract from that the enthalpy change of formation of both of the reactants. So minus 394 for carbon dioxide. Hydrogen is zero because it's an element. So even though there's a three here in the equation, that's irrelevant because hydrogen is an element. Its enthalpy of formation is zero because we're making an element from the element. So we're not actually doing anything. So when we crunch those numbers, we get an enthalpy change for this reaction of minus 49 kilojoules per mole. And so that will be two marks for those two steps, one for the working, one for the answer. Then we need to work out the entropy change and entropy change is using this row, entropy values. And just like the enthalpy change, the entropy change here is going to be entropy of the products subtract entropy of the reactants. So we've got 238 and 189 for the entropy of the products and we've got 214 and three lots of 131. This time that coefficient is really important for the hydrogen. So products minus reactants for both of these change values. And so the entropy change comes out at minus 180 joules per Kelvin per mole. Look, they've given us the units here. Let's not forget to include that in our answer and that will really signpost one of the things we need to do in a minute. And before I calculated any of these changes, I'd written down the delta G equation. That's likely to get you a mark, probably only one mark for the entropy change, given it's a six mark question. And so then we need to substitute our values into the Gibbs free energy change calculation. So we've already worked out our enthalpy change as minus 49. So that just gets put straight into the equation. And then T delta S or minus T delta S, we can put the T straight in, but because the entropy was in joules per Kelvin per mole, and our final answer needs to be in kilojoules per mole, we need to divide our entropy change by a thousand at this point before putting it into the delta G expression. Otherwise our number is going to be way out. And once we have those numbers in the expression, we just have to calculate our answer and we get a delta G value of 111 kilojoules per mole. And so that's going to be three marks for the delta G, including the equation for one mark and three marks for the delta H and delta S calculations. Sometimes a delta G calculation then goes on to ask us to state the significance of our delta G value. It doesn't here. And so we would say, right, well, this delta G is a positive value. And so that means that this change is not going to happen spontaneous. It's not going to be feasible at 890 Kelvin. 
And so a follow-up question to that might be, well, what temperature would it become feasible? And in this situation where you've got a negative entropy change and a negative enthalpy change, the reaction becomes spontaneous at the point where delta G is equal to zero. And so you rearrange the delta G expression and solve it for T, not forgetting that the entropy needs to be divided by a thousand because it's still in joules per Kelvin per mole and you can't divide kilojoules per mole by joules per Kelvin per mole. So you have to make sure that you get them both in the same units and you solve for temperature in Kelvin using this method. On this occasion, the question moves on to a graph related question. And that's where we turn the delta G equals delta H minus T delta S expression into a straight line graph. And it's easy enough to see that the delta G is going to be the Y in the expression. And minus T delta S is typically written at the end of the expression. I'm just going to bring it to the front where we've got the MX region, and I'll just put the delta H at the end. And then what you can see is that delta G is the of Y equals MX plus C, and that's why it's plotted on the Y axis. And now the temperature is on the X axis, and the gradient of this line is negative of the entropy change, and the y-intercept is the enthalpy change. And sometimes you will have to plot this graph for yourself. You might be given an empty set of axes, and you could be asked to come up with the scale yourself and then plot the graph and draw that straight line, remembering it needs to be a perfectly linear line of best fit or they might give you the numbers on the scale and just get you to plot the points for fewer marks. But what you need to remember is that there are two different shaped graphs that you can get. One of them has a positive gradient and the other one negative, depending on that entropy change. And so that's what this question is going to be asking us about here. They've told us that we need to use the values of the intercept and the gradient for the graph to calculate the enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole and the entropy change in joules per Kelvin per mole for this particular reaction. So straight up the y-intercept is the enthalpy change. And so if this is 100 and this is 150, each of these little squares is equal to five and we're one below the 150. So that's just simply 145 kilojoules per mole for our y-intercept and that's the enthalpy. So no actual calculation necessary here. The entropy change does require a calculation. We need to recognize that the gradient is the negative of the entropy change. We'll get a mark for that. We need to then calculate what the gradient is by turning this into an easy triangle. I would suggest turning this into a triangle of that size. And then with the change in Y is minus 145 kilojoules per mole because it goes down to zero from 145. And then the change in X is What's that going to be? That's 800 and that's 1,000, so that's 900. So I think that's going to be about 850 at this point. So the change in X is going to be 850. And when we do that, we get a gradient of 0 0.1706. And that's the entropy change in kilojoules per mole because we've done kilojoules per mole divided by Kelvin. So it's kilojoules per mole per Kelvin, the units of entropy change right now. We need it in joules per mole per Kelvin. And so we need to multiply that answer by a thousand, which gives us a final entropy change value of 170.6 or 171 to three significant figures. And they would allow a range of answers here depending on your judgment of X. I would imagine it would be something from 167 to 173, depending on where you've drawn your, your triangle to work out the gradient. And then the final question here says, state what the graph shows about the feasibility of the reaction. Well, remember, as I mentioned earlier, the feasibility of the reaction depends on the sign of the delta G. And so if delta G is less than or equal to zero, this reaction will be feasible and spontaneous. And so this region over here, delta G is positive. So the reaction is not feasible at this temperature from zero Kelvin, absolute zero, all the way up to about 850, 845 Kelvin or so. And so what we need to say here then is that this reaction becomes feasible at this value of 850 or so and above. And so you could say either 
this reaction is feasible at temperatures equal to or greater than 845 Kelvin or temperatures less than 845 Kelvin, it will not be feasible. Either of those angles of approach, absolutely fine. And just before I finish, if I refer back to the two sketch graphs I drew at the bottom of the page, you can see that there are two different correlations, two different gradients. The one on the left that I drew matches the one from this question, where the reaction gets more spontaneous as the temperature goes up. And so you can see that the reaction becomes spontaneous when that line crosses the x-axis and goes below it, so that's the higher temperature. And the other line has the opposite pattern. It's more feasible at the low temperatures, and once that line crosses over the x-axis, that reaction stops being feasible at that high temperature. And so the left-hand graph has a negative gradient, which means it's a positive entropy, and so becomes more feasible at the higher temperature. And the one on the right has a positive gradient, so a negative entropy change, and so it becomes less feasible as the temperature increases. Okay, that's the end of this question. That's the end of the video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.